my talk today is on a mechanism of artemisinin resistance in uh, Plasmodium falciparum malaria. Um, so just to introduce the life cycle of Plasmodium falciparum, it's very complex. Um, the drugs against falciparum, um, in blue and on the right-hand side, um, are the drugs against malaria, and they all target the blood stages of infection, and that's because they, um, they cause all the symptoms and pathologies of the disease. The drug class in green, the endoperoxides, the artemisinins, have actually been tremendously powerful tools in reducing the global burden of malaria. And malaria is actually a really big success story. Over the last decade and a half, uh, malaria burdens have been cut by 50%. Uh, deaths due to malaria are really low. Sri Lanka has declared elimination. The Indian government has launched an elimination program um, for elimination of malaria by 2030. So, Artemisinins have been the front line, and the worrisome uh, aspect of this now is that there is resistance to artemisinin. And artemisinin resistance is a little unusual compared to some of the other drug resistance that we have seen. Um, the front line of resistance is this very scenic uh, area at the Moi River, a, a natural boundary between Thailand and Myanmar. And the people who live here have resistant parasites, but they actually have very low parasite burdens. Some of them only detectable by PCR, but nonetheless, 80% of them are artemisinin resistant. And this is now sites of emerging multi-drug resistance, so there are parasites here that are resistant to all known antimalarials. And the reason it's worrisome is if you look at the epidemiology of antimalarial drug resistance, in Red and blue circles are chloroquine and SB. Those are the traditional antimalarials before artemisinin came on board. And the route of spread of resistance was from Southeast Asia to Africa, uh, where the burden of malaria remains today. So artemisinin resistance is now very widespread in Southeast Asia at the Myanmar, Bangladesh, and Myanmar Indian border. Um, and it seems to be following the same route so, you know, the real concern is that if it spreads to Africa, there could be an epidemic. So, tracking the spread of artemisinin resistance has actually been a real challenge, because resistance emerged um, in 2008-2009, but it wasn't really till 2014 that a molecular marker for artemisinin resistance was first identified as the parasite gene Kelch-13. And this was a very large study done in collaboration with Didier Manan's lab, Odile Pujalon, and Rick Fairhurst. So, um, Kelch-13, by its primary uh, sequence, is predicted to be a substrate adapter for a Cullen E3 ligase. And it has the characteristic BTB POZ domain, and then down on the C-terminus, it has those Kelch domains. And the Kelch and mutations in the Kelch domain are associated with artemisinin resistance. So all of the resistance mutations are in those Kelch domains. And this is studies from Arya as well as Ashley et al. in the New England Journal of Medicine. So the hypothesized model for the action of Kelch-13 and the effects of mutation are laid out on this slide. And basically, if you have wild-type Kelch-13, you, in conjunction with the ring Cullen E2 complex, um, you would bind the substrate and get ubiquitination of that substrate and then subsequent proteasomal degradation. Um, a mutant couch should not bind the substrate. You should not get ubiquitination and substrate increase should somehow be associated with artemisinin resistance. So this is all very well and good, but what does it have to do with us? So anyone who knows me is that, you know, we're interested in remodeling of the red cell by the malaria parasite. And, um, you know, one of the areas we've been working on is looking at phosphoinositides in the endoplasmic reticulum of malaria parasites. And so, just to put it in perspective, uh, you know, the, the cell in red is the red cell, which is where the parasite is, and it's encapsulated in a parasitophorous vacuolar membrane, um, and then the parasite plasma membrane, and the PI3P that we look at is in the endoplasmic reticulum of the parasite. So it's actually, this is where it started. 
we determined that um, using a reporter system that low nanomolar concentrations of dihydroartemisinin, which is the active form of all artemisinins, blocked parasite PI3P production. So this was something that Sovik Patacharji, when he was a postdoctoral fellow in the lab, uh, made this observation. So it was kind of a sheer discovery thing. And the other thing that we, uh, Sovik found out, was that the deoxy artemisinins have no effect. All artemisinins and PI3 kinase inhibitors were effective. And the other antimalarial drugs, like the aminoclins, the DHFR inhibitors, do not have this effect. And then he went on, um, and in the paper that we subsequently published in 2015, you know, we showed that DHA reduces mass levels of PI3P in the parasite, but more importantly, when we immunopurified PI3K from the parasite, it potently inhibits the immunopurified PI3K and has now also been shown with recombinant PI3K. We didn't have recombinant PI3K at the time. And then by computational modeling, the artemisinin, the DHA fits very well. There's a tremendous shape complementarity in the active site of the parasite kinase. And there's a lot of selectivity because the dihydroartemisinin, even at 10 micromolar, did not inhibit 40 mammalian kinases. So uh, it was not a promiscuous kinase um, inhibitor. So the finding that artemisinins potently target PI3K was actually very unexpected. They are known to have many targets, and that's actually what results in killing. These are endoperoxides, and the cleavage of that bridge creates free radicals, which inserts into everything in the cell. And this is really generated in the later stages of infection, and uh, because the iron that's required for the cleavage comes from the digestion of hemoglobin. So what we started to think was that was DHA's potent targeting of the parasite kinase in early rings linked to resistance, and this is because although the killing activity is maximal in the trophozoite stages, from the clinical studies we knew that resistance is a ring stage property, and it was actually defined as a delayed clearance of rings in patients. So these were experiments actually done, you know, looking at clearance in patients as they waited in the clinic by Don Dorp and Nodal uh, in, published in NEJM 2009. So we asked whether PI3K is a substrate of Kelch 13, and just to put you back through the model, our expectation would have been the following, which is what we showed in the paper, but I thought I wouldn't troll you through all the data. So the PI3K does in fact form a complex with Kelch 13. It is, undergoes K48 ubiquitination, so you know it's going to the proteasome. The resistance mutations blocks the uh, complex formation. Resistance mutation blocks the K48 ubiquitination. It, Resistance mutation blocks the degradation of PI3K. This is genetically independent. It doesn't matter whether you do it in laboratory strains or in clinical strains. Um, and it doesn't matter how you genetically modify the parasite. And then finally, that PI3P elevation alone, independent of K13 mutations, is sufficient to cause resistance. And so I'm going to show you this one data slide because it matters to the rest of the talk. And basically what you see here is resistance on the y-axis PI3P moles on the x-axis in black triangles are the clinical strains that are resistant in. Um, yeah, so the resistant lab-engineered strains are in circles, and the sensitive strains are not filled. And I think you can see the red circle out there. That's a lab strain that has no K13 mutation, but it's expressing human PI3 kinase, so VPS34, um, and it has, its resistance level has changed a log compared to the inactive form. So um, this was what was published, and basically at the bottom end of the slide is where we proceeded, which is what happens downstream of PI3P? Why is PI3P alone um, possible to induce um, artemisinin resistance um, in these parasites? And we were guided also by a publication by Mark et al. in 2015, and they had looked at in vivo transcriptomes of over a thousand clinical falciparum strains with acute malaria, and found that resistance was associated with the unfolded protein response and the ROSC and trick chaperone complexes. So our interest was to ask, you know, since we had found PI3P was important, where is the PI3P in the parasite? and how is it linked to the UPR. So um, 
we, as I said at the, early, at the outset, we had detected PI3P in the ER using a reporter system, and it's a secretory PI, uh, PX domain in young rings. Um, the movie won't run, and it'll save us a minute, but basically this is to show that this reporter system, you can detect the PI3P at all stages. And um, we knew that this compartment had some cargo, and by using, and we wanted to convert this lipid signal into a proteome because we wanted to compare it to the transcriptome. So by using the proteinaceous cargo, we did an IP um, and pulled down the proteome and did that in and did that analysis. And these studies actually were very recently published, came online last week in blood. So um, what we found was that the proteome contained Kelch 13, that was very gratifying. The abundance ratio was 0 0.9, the best you could do is one. Um, it has, it's a large proteome of 503 proteins. Um, and if you do a systems analysis and look at the predictions, um, what you come up with in the annotation is a proteome that essentially looks at an ER vesicle system that Kelch 13 is enriched in. And Kelch 13 is not enriched in mitochondria, nucleus, apicoplast, food vacuole, et cetera. So um, as validation, we said, okay, if PI3P targets these cargo to the erythrocyte and these cargo co-purify with Kelch 13, then does Kelch 13 localize to PI3P? And what is the localization of this endogenous PI3P? And so Isabel Coppins carried out this beautiful immunoelectron microscopy studies and showed that PI3P was found in the apicoplast and the food vacuole, as you would expect, uh, but also in the parasite ER, and by stereological analysis, that in fact the bulk of the signal is in the parasite ER, um, and that it was in the lumen as well as the cytoplasmic phase. Um, by co-localization studies showed that the ER marker BIP was associated with PI3P, um, and that K13 co-localizes with PI3P, and again, stereological analysis showed the co-association of K13 with BIP and, and PI3P, and concluded that K13 is actually a marker for PI3P, and both are predominantly in the ER. So the hypergeometric analysis of this proteome with the clinical transcriptome basically showed us that there was significant association with the upregulated transcriptome, but not the downregulated transcriptome. And it predicted that vesicle fate should be linked to upregulation of the clinical resistance transcriptome. So again, by immuno-EM, what Isabel showed was that Kelch 13, in fact, the major mutation, uh, which is responsible for over 85% of uh, resistance in uh, Southeast Asia, increased PI3P tubules and vesicles and propagates them throughout the entire parasite. So if you look at the quantitative analysis, there's about three and a half times more PI3P. And by stereological analysis, while most of the signal continues to be in the ER, you can see that those gray bars are higher at every site in the cell. And basically, PI3P propagates throughout the parasite in um, these mutants. So here you can see in the middle panel, uh, the C580Y, um, you can actually see the gold inside the nucleus. I mean, actually, this gold is everywhere. Um, if you look at the magnified section um, on the far right-hand side, you know, it's, it's looped within loops, um, and it completely envelops the, the parasite. So when we looked at parasites that don't have Kelch 13 mutations, but we, where we have artificially engineered uh, resistance by uh, putting in the human PI3K, and we compared those proteomes for their induction of UPR and ROSC through that ER vesicle system, we actually see a remarkable correspondence between what Mark et al. Uh, published and what we find. And basically for every pathway that they have, they found significant signal in the transcriptome, we have better signal in the proteome. We, um, you know, have completely enriched for this system. So our first conclusion, which is that K13, which is the first causal marker of artemisinin resistance, is actually a marker for P. falciparum PI3P. Um, and that expansion of PI3P by K13 mutation or synthetically induces artemisinin resistance and is a major feature of inducing UPR and ROSC and ER stress. And this is important to note because there is now K13 independent 
artemisinin and resistance that has been reported in multiple places. So we are very interested now in being able to look at this vesicular system because our data suggests that resistance is induced by an expansion of homeostatic ER vesiculation. So a simplified schematic of protein quality control in the ER and the cytoplasm of wild type parasites with the components that have been implicated in resistance are, of course, PI3P, and then you've got BIP in the ER lumen, binds to unfolded proteins, coupled to the ER ERAD, and then, of course, the TRIC system. So what happens in resistant parasites is that that mutation results in amplification of PFPI3K and PI3P. This gives you ER vesicles of proteostasis, and leads, that leads to induction of the chaperone transcripts um, and, and trick. So the artemisinins, as I said at the outset, kill by alkylating, misfolding, and aggregation of proteins or inducing proteopathy. So the question arises, do one, two, and three, these pathways actually mitigate artemisinin-induced proteinopathy? And really, since one is the driving mechanism, is that autophagy? Because that's what we know when you've got PI3P vesicles proliferating in the ER. And it is actually tempting to speculate, but it is by no means proven. Autophagy in plasmodium is very poorly understood, and the mechanism is not well delineated. The major con against this is that hypervesiculation in these K13 mutants are single membrane tubules. Jen, we learned yesterday that autophagy is double membrane. And also, these vesicles are clear. They don't contain any cytoplasmic ribosomal or organella contents. They're everywhere. Um, and it may explain why every cellular system in the parasite has been reported to be affected in artemisinin resistance, but we don't yet know the resistance. What we do know is that artemisinin resistance also impacts the cell biology of malaria virulence. Um, basically, K13 mutation impacts the dynamics of virulence export to, and the, in the mutants, the export gains resistance to DHA. So what you see here are immunoelectron micrographs by Isabel showing that PI3P is not just in the parasite, but shown in the red arrows are these structures that the parasite induces in the red cell, and proteins from the parasite going from the parasite to the red cell use these. So since we knew that PI3P production was blocked by dihydroartemisinin, um, we looked at these resistant parasites, and again, this is work was done in collaboration with Sovic, um, looking in both sensitive parasites, so those are wild-type parasites, and resistant parasites. This is um, in a laboratory strain that was engineered by CRISPR-Cas9. And you can see that when you add artemisinin to the sensitive parasites, you actually block the export of this virulence de determinant, but in the resistant parasites, you don't. And you can take this one step further to cytoadherence, because what these adhesins allow the parasite to do is actually attach to the endothelium. Um, and you know, it can really sequester in tissues. Um, and so this is a cytoadherence assay. And you can see that the gray bars is where the Sovic treated um, these parasites with dihydroartemisinin. And the parental parasites, you can block the adhesion right away. But in the mutants, and this is C580Y and R539T, so if you use those mutations, you pretty much cover 95% of parasites um, that are resistant. So there you can see that you cannot, you no longer block the adherence phenotype. If you, if you actually overexpress K13 in the system, then you take wild type parasites down too, excuse me, in their adhesive capacity. So the implication here is that in addition to protecting the infected red cell against proteopathy, these resistance mutations may actually provide better adherence to host receptors and therefore immune evasion even in presence of drug. And this may contribute to the persistence of resistant parasites at low and asymptomatic parasitemias despite mass drug administration. So, you know, uh, at the start I showed you this very idyllic picture and I said these are people who have very low parasitemias because they have been, there's been a lot of mass drug administration that's been done to eliminate the last of the parasites, but they continue to have these asymptomatic parasites that are very, very resistant to elimination. And it's possible 
that this very basic science observation that we made might help us shed some light in clearing these low parastemias. So I would like to conclude with acknowledgments. Um, so the past lab members who contributed tremendously to the project, Alassane Meng, Sovik Patsharji, and Mehdi Gorbal, um, and uh, present lab members, uh, Nija Suresh and uh, Innocent Safiku, are collaborators, um, Isabel Coppins, and as you can see, Sovik has moved from past lab member to now a collaborator at JNU, uh, Sinyao, Dave Spiker at Penn, Nala Mohandas at the New York Blood Center, and uh, Arjun Dondo at Oxford Mahidol, and then Carolyn and Rob, who are uh, lipid experts. And this was supported um, by, in the US, by the US labs, um, by the National Institutes of Health, and uh, in Sovik's lab by Indian government DST and DBT Ramil Lingaswamy Reentry Fellowship. Thank you.